The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. The first speaker is going to be uh, Scott DiStefano. Uh, he graduated from the Stevens Institute of Technology with a BE in Mechanical Engineering. He's been working with SICA for the last seven years as a product engineer and sales representative handling product lines ranging from cementitious underlayments to anchoring. He's currently the pr uh, product manager for the resins lines of products, including epoxies, coatings, and FRP. Scott is a member of the industry, of industry organizations such as ICRI and ACI, and frequently practices and presents at industry functions. Uh, Scott is gonna do the first two sessions, uh, which wrap one is structural crack repair by epoxy injection, uh, wrap number two, which is the crack repair by gravity feed with resins. Morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, on a bright, sunny day in Vegas, learning about epoxy crack injection, gravity feed, just general concrete repair. Very exciting stuff, I know. I know you guys are very excited. I can see it in your faces. You guys are really exuding a lot of excitement this morning, so I'm just going to get started because I don't actually have a lot of time. So wrap one is uh, obviously structural crack repair. These are kind of the basics of the wrap document, going through the purposes, when to use, why to use it. The most important one, I think, is proper preparation. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit. Uh, materials, equipment, and then the actual, um, the basics of the repair. This is the, uh, I think the tagline for a lot of the, uh, the crack repair documents is life, death, taxes, and cracks. They're all inevitable. Uh, they're all bound to happen eventually. Uh, so what are some of the causes of cracks in structural concrete? Um, there's very, there's, there's a, a bunch of them. There's very many of them. But some of the main ones include drying shrinkage, uh, thermal contraction expansion, freeze thaw, settlement, uh, it could be a lack of appropriate joints, it could just be a, a misdesign from the get-go, or overloaded uh, in many conditions, could be compressive, could be tensile, could be flexural, it could be shear cracks, or even a restraint in movement. So that also comes back to the original design, typically. Uh, or it could be a change in use. Uh, the purpose of the repair is really for twofold. Uh, one is to restore the structural integrity to the, uh, the initial structure, whether it's a building, a bridge, uh, anything concrete, tank, or it's to resist moisture penetration. So this is down to certain size cracks. So you got your 0 .002 inch uh, width or greater, so pretty small. When to use injection. So a lot of people are thinking that injection is only for vertical or overhead, but that's not necessarily true. Injection can also be used on a horizontal slab as well, and typically that's going to be when the cracks are very fine and gravity is just not going to do enough. But before we do any repairs, uh, the most important things are to determine what caused it and, and is it really necessary? Do, is it a structural member to begin with? Is it needed to um, really reinforce the structure or is it just really cosmetic? Uh, because crack injection just may not be necessary. And if we don't know the cause, then typically you're going to see it again. So you're going to do the repair, and however, you know, an indeterminate amount of time later, you're going to see that same crack or a crack adjacent to it show up. So determining the root cause is very, very important. And again, if, if you don't need it, then there's other ways that you can uh, inject or repair a crack. So, like I said, I think the most important part of this is the surface preparation. And this really goes for any concrete repair in general. 95% uh, is preparation, 5% is material and application. Uh, so for surface prep, it's, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, and it can be just as simple as a wire brush. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. Typically, we try to stray away from grinders or, or large-scale mechanical because that tends to just force more dust and more concrete dust into the cracks, which then makes it harder uh, in the long term to repair. So keeping it basic, keeping it simple with a wire brush or a wire wheel uh, is typically um, sufficient. Generally, it's a half inch on both sides of the crack, so you have one inch of preparation. So fairly sim simple, fairly easy, doesn't take a lot of time, but that's probably the one part of crack injection that gets overlooked and uh, and doesn't get done correctly, uh, which then obviously causes, and we'll kind of we'll see a couple of them causes more work and more headaches uh, down the line. They can be pressure washed, but that has to you know basically dry out before injecting. Uh, you can use moisture tolerant epoxies, uh, 
But it's always, it's always good to allow a certain amount of dry time. Um, <clears throat> on, a gra on a horizontal slab, that's typically 24 hours. If you're going to use compressed air to blow out, if you do have a lot of dust or you do have a lot of debris in the crack, using compressed air, you want to make sure that's oil free, that there's an oil trap, because the last thing you want is to just force oil deep into the crack while you're trying to you know, get a good bond. Um, vacuuming is always a good idea. And then V-notching or grooving can be done. Uh, it's not always necessary on a vertical or, or um, overhead crack, but is typically a very good idea for horizontal. But typically it's only done in a vertical if there is uh, a lot of deterioration around the edges of the crack. If the crack is not just a, you know, a linear, you know, solid concrete on both sides, typically the V-notch is a good idea to, to reinforce the edges and to get a much solid, a much more solid cap seal over the crack. Believe it or not, this is actually pretty good prep. I mean, they had a lot of, of um, contaminants on the surface, but they made sure to remove uh, pretty much 100% of it uh, around that crack. And really, more is better. So they definitely went a little uh, farther than a uh, half inch, which is great. Uh, this is actually what you don't want to see. Uh, if you go in and they've marked up the crack directly on the crack with spray paint, that's kind of a first sign of, OK, now we have to do either do prep again or do prep to begin with. Um, so selecting the correct materials. Uh, in crack injection, strength is obviously very important, but one of the main factors is going to be viscosity. You know, the closer to water your epoxy is going to be, the easier it is going to be to force into, you know, smaller and smaller cracks. So typically for, for about, you know, 0 0.01 inches, 500 centipoise or less is going to be the requirement. And typically they're going to be even less than that, typically around 100 centipoise. And depending on the size of the crack, if you're larger, you can get away with you know slightly higher, up to 1,000, 1,500. Um, but you know the lower is is typically better in this case. The other kind of governing document for material uh, selection uh, in, 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 and is referenced in both wrap documents is uh, ASTM C881. Is everyone here familiar with C881? No one's familiar with C881. Okay, a couple people. Good. So. 881 uh, is, a, is a fairly large ASTM um, test document that kind of determines what type of epoxy uh, or what an epoxy is good for and what type of applications. Uh, for crack repair, it's typically going to be hardened to hardened concrete, uh, but there are functions of 881 that are fresh to hardened concrete or, uh, or non-structural. So these are both typically um, hardened to hardened concrete in structural applications. Uh, and they consider modulus elasticity, so your rigidity of the epoxy, your working life, your moisture tolerance, and then, and or color if if that is necessary. So that's those are other other options. Uh, proper equipment. It doesn't have to be super complicated. This is a very common small scale crack injection piece of equipment. It's just basically a bucket with a hand pump, and you know you can get enough pressure uh, with something like that. And, and, it, and it works. It's easy to clean. It's, it's very inexpensive. Uh, you can use it over and over, and it lasts forever. Or, you know, if you have a lot of crack injection to do, you can use something a little bit more sophisticated, uh, some type of hydraulic pump. And they come in all different shapes and sizes from all different manufacturers. You can use air guns. I, I've seen projects where guys used a, uh, an air gun or a grease gun, even, to do whole rooms worth of crack injection, which it wasn't probably the optimal solution, but he did it and it worked. So you know, he can't really blame him for that. It, you know, he had what he you know he had what he had and, and he used it. Uh, safety is always very important when working with chemicals of any of any nature. Uh, making sure you have the proper SDS and the proper documentation when using epoxies, wearing the right PPE, wearing gloves, wearing uh, eye protection. Um, if anybody's done crack injection themselves. Uh, you do realize that it is under pressure. So if something were to go wrong, which hopefully it will not, there is always that chance that it could blow back at you. I've been in that situation. Thank goodness I had my glasses on because I was covered in epoxy. So that it's always, always good to keep safety uh, at the forefront of these types of applications, or really any applications. So now to kind of get into the repair procedure, the first, obviously after preparation, because again, number one, uh, is going to be the port installation. So you can have a couple different types of ports. 
Uh, they could either be surface mounted or socket type. Uh, surface mounted is probably the most typical. Um, socket type are usually when you really don't have access from the surface. If there's something in the way, if there's some type of calcification or, or just super, super narrow, but it gets wider at the base, uh, there's a couple different reasons where you would use a socket, but again, uh, the surface mounted ports are more typical. You can use a manifold, you can do a couple at once, but typically uh, in, in normal size applications, you're just doing one at a time. Uh, now, how far away do we space the ports? Does anybody know? Any guesses? 18 inches. 18 inches. Possibly. 18 inches seems to, it would be a little on the wide side. Typically, they're going to be eight inches, uh, but they can go no, they go no closer than six, and thinner slabs or, or smaller, finer cracks could be 12 inches, and, and I have seen applications where they have gone higher than that. Um, this is a, a good example of you know, a fairly fine crack, good preparation, uh, good port placement, um, and you can see, depending on the, the width of the crack in certain areas, the ports were, were spaced uh, in relation to that. So the, the finer the cracks, uh, the closer they were together. So once the ports are installed, and this kind of usually goes hand in hand uh, with the port installation, you're using the same epoxy typically, you're using a gel type epoxy, uh, you install the cap seal. So a lot of times you kind of butter the port, and you, you know, place them, and then immediately after that you're installing the epoxy around the, uh, uh, around the crack. Your typical crack uh, our cap seal is going to be one inch by three sixteenths, but in this application, more is, is never uh, an issue. Uh, the last thing you want to do is to have a leak in your cap seal once you start injecting. It's a, it's a really tough situation to get out of once, you, once you're in there. So to make sure you have you know, full, consistent coverage, uh, if, you're, if you're ever unsure if there's a gap or a space, add more epoxy. Uh, again, you're going to be typically removing this at the end anyway, so uh, it's really not a big deal to have more. Uh, again, you're going to have a non-sag consistency for your cap seal typically. Um, typically, it's going to be moisture tolerant, has a decent pot life or decent working life, so it gives you enough time to mix it and then spread it. And then it's, it's typically fairly rigid. Uh, so here's installing your cap seal. Um, this is an example of, of that V-notch that I was talking about before, where they've actually just done a socket type um, port. and. Again, typically this is because you have deteriorated concrete around the edge of the crack. So it would be much more difficult to bridge it than it is just to install your port in the crack and then fill around it. Uh, and this, this is your surface mounted. Some other considerations when uh, using these epoxies is to obviously make sure that everything's in shelf life. Uh, epoxies do last a long time, but it's always good to make sure that you're using fresh material. Make sure that you're accurately batching. Uh, as a manufacturer, we don't typically recommend to batch down epoxies, but it is done, uh, and there are uh, considerations to be, uh, to be had around that. Making sure that you're following the right ratios uh, in your mixing proportions is very, very important to make sure that the epoxy cures. Mixing in small batches uh, in large projects is never a bad idea. You don't want to mix up you know, 10 gallons all at once, and then you have you know, 10 feet here and then 10 feet over there and 10 feet over there, you're never going to get there in time. So making sure you do maybe a gallon at a time or half a gallon at a time is important. Uh, and again, consistency over the crack is, is very important because the last thing you want is to have a blowout. So this is probably one of the best application photos I've ever seen. That's basically a perfect cap seal and a perfect application. Um, this is what happens when you have a blowout. You just have low viscosity epoxy running out of your crack. So what do you do then? Because now there's, most of the material that's supposed to be in the crack is now outside the crack, and it's going to cure, so now you have a crack that's half filled, half not filled, it becomes a very difficult situation to remedy after the fact. So again, making sure that cap seal is, uh, is tight is very important. Uh, and then last is to actually inject the epoxy. You wait for your cap seal to cure, uh, and then you double check everything, again, making sure that there's no gaps, there's no loose ports or anything. You mix your epoxy and then start injecting. Uh, for horizontal, you start at the widest point, and for vertical, uh, you start from the bottom and work upwards. You continue until you refusal, so typically if you're injecting here, you'll wait till you start to see epoxy come out here, you'll cap your port and move on to the next one and work your way down the line. This is very important, because again, for, for that situation where you could have a blowout, um, if you, are having issues, you do have fine cracks that you don't think you're getting in, you can up the pressure 
to about 200 PSI, and you don't want to keep it there forever, maybe, maybe five minutes, and keeping a very, very, very close eye on what's kind of going on, um, and then kind of let, let go and, and maybe try it on another port. At the end, you can remove with a grinder the ports and the cap seal, but that is not required and is an optional step, typically only for aesthetics, uh, if it's going to be somewhere that is, is visible to the, uh, you know, somebody walking by. There's evaluation techniques, uh, but typically, in my opinion, uh, coring is the best way to, uh, to find out if you've actually done what you set out to do. The two inch cores, and typically, they, it's a very easy test, they just kind of hit it with a hammer, and if it breaks somewhere else than the, the crack, then you know you've done a good job. Uh, there are a couple non-destructive evaluations that are you know, referenced and, and used, so there are ways around that, but again, the core is really uh, the best way to know for sure. Those are the sources from the wrap document. And I know that was quick, but I also went over time, so it wasn't quick enough. Mm. So any mm. questions? Given the importance of the uh, seal, is there any, um, you know, this is a blue sky question, is there like any type of solvent, quick dry, that you can put through to make sure you have, have a proper seal before you actually do the injection? Not really, because okay. once, once you've injected it, uh, if it was an open crack, I would say sure, because it's going to flash off. But once it's sealed, there's really nothing, uh, nothing you can inject in there first that's really going to drain out completely and allow you to, to really inject that crack fully. Okay, one more, the last one. If installed properly, is your position that this does restore structural integrity? Absolutely, absolutely. When, uh, when this is installed properly, the bond line between, or the bond line that was fixed, that crack, is now uh, stronger than any of the concrete on either side of it. So if there was anything going to happen later on down the line, if there was movement or settlement, you, will n you won't see a crack there again, you will see a crack somewhere else. So abs absolutely.